In European Union, we succeed with so many things and it's 2023 and we still not succeeded with the thing which should be obvious and natural, gender equality. We were pushing hardly that the next EU health strategy will recognize sexual and reproductive health rights, that this standard will be a common standard from the perspective of health rights for all the EU citizens. Mr. Biedron, thanks for being with us. It's already evening in Brussels. You're just arriving from the airport. Uh, you've been in Poland, your home country. Well, Poland is a country that has been in the spotlight in the last few years for the deterioration of the women's rights there. And this parliament has been very vocal about it. It has criticized the de facto ban on abortion. It has asked the European Union to do something to change the situation. But uh, how far can the European Union go in that, in that sense? Thank you for having me. And of course, uh, we see the deterioration of women's rights in Poland. Polish women uh, in today's Poland, they have less rights than when Poland was entering uh, European Union in 2004. So you see there's something going wrong. And this backlash is not seen only in Poland, but in other member states. What sh European Union should do is to create finally a union of equal rights for everyone. And uh, uh, it shouldn't be a dream. Since we created a union of standardization of the uh, uh, roaming system of uh, the chargers why should we not create a system of standard rights for women rights and this is not the case in 2023 in European Union which should lead um, uh, by example. But when we talk about reproductive rights and abortion that comes into national uh, competency, right? Uh, so some critics say that would be meddling into national affairs to, to try to change something in there. What do you respond to that? Women's rights are human rights. So from this perspective, uh, should women have a, a choice to decide about her body or her life? It's her body, her life, and it should be her choice. And it's not the case in many member states. And uh, when we see the situation where uh, in today's Poland, uh, because of the judgment of uh, so-called constitutional tri tribunal, which says the fact that women cannot execute legal and safe abortion, and because of that six citizens dies, that's something wrong. And we need to improve it. When we see that among already 7 million girls and women who passed the border, uh, EU border with Ukraine, there are Ukrainian uh, refugees, there are girls raped by uh, Russian soldiers, and they're coming to Poland and they're finding out that in Poland they cannot terminate this rape. There's something wrong with European Union that we are not giving this uh, right. And which tools does the European Union have to pressure national governments to change that? We have a Charter of Fundamental Rights, we have treaties which says that everyone is equal, that we should have the same standards concerning human rights. As a committee dealing with women's rights and gender equality, we were pushing hardly that the next EU health strategy will recognize sexual and reproductive health rights, that this standard will be a common standard from the perspective of health rights for all the EU citizens. And another important issue that you're dealing with this year is violence against women. Um, the European Commission has put on the table a proposal to create a common rules for all European countries to deal with it. Why is it important to have common rules on that? We are tackling so many crimes and uh, violence against women is not recognized by European Union as a euro crime and uh, uh, it should be a standard. There are two important tools which we can use. The first one uh, is mentioned by you, the pressure directive combating uh, violence against women and domestic violence. We uh, started to work on that. But the second important file which helps us put the standards on combating violence against girls and women is, of course, Istanbul Convention. Just to explain quickly to people who are watching us that the Istanbul Convention is the main pan-European instrument to fight 
uh, violence against girls and women. Which should be ratified by all member states, it's not the case, and should be ratified by European Union to make a one standard for, for all, for, for example, concerning data collection. I know that Parliament had been asking for the European Union to be a party in the Convention as well. The Council has just uh, uh, proposed uh, to the Parliament that we will give the green light to um, ratification of the Istanbul Convention. It's a very much awaited sign, especially in the context of war in Ukraine, where we have uh, uh, millions of girls and women fleeing from Ukraine, seeking protection and finding out that there is no one standard within the European Union concerning protection of girls and women against violence. In practice, what would change by the European Union as a whole body uh, ratifying this convention? Would this change the fact that six uh, European countries haven't ratified the convention yet? It will bring the standardization concerning protection, uh, prevention, I mentioned the data collection, but it will also have uh, impact on education of girls and women, boys and men. It will bring standardization in help for the victims of, the, of violence. All the tools which will bring the one approach of European Union, the common approach towards uh, fighting against uh, violence against girls and women. It will be complementary to, uh, to the proposed directive by European Commission. Cyber violence against girls and women uh, also will be addressed by this directive proposal by European Commission. Istanbul Convention is not mentioning um, because it's an older document and this phenomenon is developing in internet. So we as European Parliament we will make sure that both of these documents will work together. And be complementary, and as be you said. Uh, when it comes to gender equality in the workplace, there has been some positive developments in the European Union in terms of legislation. This Parliament has just recently approved new rules that uh, that introduce quotas for women in uh, top jobs of big companies. Why was it necessary? Why is it necessary to, in 2023 to introduce quotas for women? I know it's surprising to me as well why it's necessary, but it's really needed. These kind of tools are helping women uh, to achieve what for many men, and I say it as, uh, as a male politician, we are receiving as that, just because we are men. In European Union, a little bit more than 8% of CEO, CEOs uh, of, of the companies are women, are female, 8%. And women are more than half of this society. There is a glass ceiling um, uh, which stops uh, women of achieving these high positions in companies. Uh, women are more educated. 61% of university graduates in U European Union are women. So what happens that they're not getting these high profile jobs is of course this uh, patriarchal system and this directive women on boards is trying to handle with it, uh, um, uh, giving opportunity for women to uh, be represented in uh, uh, publicly listed companies. And I can tell you that uh, I, I used to be a mayor and uh, when I became a mayor, I started to uh, manage municipal companies. And in these municipal companies, there were only men. Uh, to my surprise, I asked these men why they are not women. And they said women are not interested in an environment cases, uh, in water supply, in cleaning the streets, and so Which on and so on. Which is not true. Which is not true, of course. And then we, I introduced quotas, and suddenly, it appeared that there are many women who want to be in these well-paid jobs and uh, to, to take responsibility for water supply, for uh, uh, environment issue in the city and so on and so on. So uh, just give women a chance. They are very well prepared to take over. Another new rules that this parliament is getting ready to, to vote or to give the final green light soon, it's the one that we call the pay transparency, which you will uh, require big companies to disclose the salaries that they pay to men and women. I understand that this is intended to, to reduce the pay gap, the gender pay gap. Can you explain to us how this will be possible, how this legislation will be able to do this? Gender pay gap is a reality. Our mothers, our uh, uh, grandmothers, our sisters, our female co-workers, they earn less 
their pensions are smaller than the male pensions. And this is a reality. The gender pay gap in European Union is 13%. In some member states is more, in some members uh, it's less, but it's a, uh, it's a reality. And uh, we need to, to approach this issue. Uh, so uh, for us, the goal was clear. The more transparency we have in uh, this field, the more visible uh, inequalities are, and it's easier to, uh, to approach that. I, I think uh, it's, a, it's a fair treatment of, uh, of the workers, that, that they should know uh, that uh, while you have the same uh, level of knowledge and uh, your effort is the same and your engagement in the work is the same, you should be paid equally. And this is not the case. To conclude, I would like to ask you a rather provocative question. You are a man, you are chairing yes. a committee dedicated to women's rights. Uh, isn't that a paradox? I bet you've heard this question many times already. Yes, I heard it a lot and I must say it's an, uh, a proud to be uh, chairing Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee. Because I believe that gender equality is for men and women. It's not only for women. Uh, we, as men, uh, we uh, should be in solidarity with uh, girls and women, and we should be supporting girls and women. There is a special place for men not supporting women in hell. Do we need more education for men on gender equality? Of course. Uh, and it should start from boys, not only men. Uh, it should start from the early school to understand in, uh, inequalities. And I think we would be all more sensitive if this was a, a standard uh, thing. In European Union, we succeed with so many uh, uh, things. And it's 2023, and we still not succeeded with the thing which should be obvious and natural, gender equality. And we still treat women like they don't have equal rights. All the statistics show that we need still 60 years to achieve gender equality in European Union. That's we a lot. Would, it's a lot. We would think it's a paradise, but for many girls and women, it's still a hell, and it shouldn't be. Thank you very much. From the European Parliament, I'm Marcia Bisotto, and this is Robert Biedon, the chair of the Parliament's Committee on Gender Equality and Women's Rights. Thank you very much. It was my honor. Thank you.